Unleash the power of your training. Welcome to How Your Own Brand Story Will Set You Apart. Here are your hosts, Dr. Dennis Rebello and Matt Cole. Uh, it's time to welcome Dr. Rebello. Uh, he is a professor, speaker, a career coach. His book, Story Like You Mean It, was featured as one of the eight authors sharing secrets to a fruitful life on Forbes. Uh, along with entrepreneurs, these seven authors share personal stories to better your lifestyle. Uh, today, he'll be sharing the steps of his peak storytelling mode, his research-based method for crafting the narrative of who you are and what drives you and why, and uses examples to help you make uh, make you a storytelling hero. Please welcome Dr. Rebella. Yeah, thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate it. And uh, of course, at, just to echo what you said, you know, please post in the chat if you have a question that comes up. I'm, at the front end of this session, I'm going to go a little bit wild. I'm going to really uh, front end it so we get to know each other quickly and you folks get to know the methodology. I'm going to jump to a PowerPoint, only the guide visuals. There's not a lot of, well, there's a little bit of language there, but it's not overwhelming. So let's go right to the screen share. And uh, if this goes well, uh, we will see, uh, we will see, uh, something show up very shortly. And, uh, do you see something? Yes. All right. So it looks like, uh, we're, we're, we, we took off, uh, well, this is a good ascension. Okay. So I wrote this book story, like you mean it, but I didn't write it for me. I wrote it for other people. So my story, uh, didn't end up being one where I was in pro sports, uh, for my whole life, but I ended up in pro sports because I told a story. And I built a company called the Sports Mind Institute with a couple of executives, one from the NFL, one from the Major League Baseball space, and another person from uh, private sort of family enterprises who built uh, camps, like learning camps for, uh, for sports. And I was telling a story out at Zappos about storytelling and how it's really difficult to tell stories and how if you are able to crack the code of a methodology, it can be really helpful because you can use it as an apparatus for organizing key moments in your life. And that's how I started the Sports Mind Institute. And some of the folks that I've worked with are Tony Dungy, Mike Tannenbaum, who you might know from the GM days of the Jets uh, before he went to the Miami Dolphins. Uh, Paul D. Podesta is from Moneyball. If you've seen the book or read the book or seen the movie with Brad Pitt and, uh, uh, you know, then you know he was not Brad Pitt. Uh, he was uh, uh, the other person, but he was the one who cracked the code uh, as well on how to get to analytics uh, or use analytics as a lever for assessing talent. So I've worked with a lot of really cool people and you see a bunch of them here, Robin Arzon from Peloton. And the question that always plagued me in my life in helping folks was, uh, it, I always go for the complicated. How do you explain who you are so that you're not misunderstood as an individual, whether it's in sales, it's in uh, business development slash sales, whether it's because you're a leader, maybe you're doing a career transition bit, maybe you're being onboarded into an organization and this is a chance for your identity to come alive. So I'm gonna play for you a short video to kind of get the essence of the problem that I was looking to solve. Okay, and bear with me for just a moment. Here we go. Oh. Ah. And for the sake of time, we are going to skip over that video and uh, very uh, quickly. The essence of the video was this. Uh, tell me about yourself. The most difficult question to ever answer, the one that sometimes is voiced and sometimes it's unvoiced. People aren't looking for why are you, why are you representing this company because of the company if you're selling, it's why are you representing the company and who are you to be representing the company? Matt and I were having a conversation beforehand and I don't really know who Matt is. He was going through all of this technical stuff really well, but I didn't know what his identity was, right? And this is, by the way, this is not some sort of psychological existential journey. This is a, I come from a physics background, so I like structure. I'm half Portuguese and half Irish. My dad was an engineer, loved mechanical systems. Um, I love old cars. I love Alfa Romeo's, old Porsches. Uh, love Mercedes Benz as well, 190 SLs, also Chevys. I've had a couple of those. And what I know to be true is that whenever there's a problem, if you can crack the code to it, you can help others. So my life was about cracking codes. And I did this as a young science fair kid. 
and they did this as a BMX rider. They seem very different, but you'll see how they're the same probably towards the end of this presentation. And what I, what I realized was that there was something going on that, so this diagram that I'm sharing with you, what you see is everybody, no matter who you are at any age and stage is trying to solve for this, but not really because they're not actually using a method. They show up, right? You show up, I show up, we show up and we say who we are. We start, it's an unconscious moment or semi-conscious moment. Hopefully it's, you get conscious of it that, hey, I am going to uh, tell a story about who I am. So if you're at a conference, you're a new student at a school, it's your first day on the job, you're the leader who bought the company, whatever it is, you're going through HR, you're being assimilated, right? And then you tell your story to people and you have an unclear start, a rough unfolding. And then you can see as the diagram goes on and on and on that this is not a very good situation. Now, this is why it happens. People get stuck. What moment in my life should I share with Matt as I just met Matt or Evan, right? I don't know which one, which one should I share? And then they pick one based on a really quick sort of judgment. Hey, I see he has something behind him that looks like a golf bag. Maybe I'll tell him about my cousin who's a really great golfer. And then you have a rough unfolding and un after the unclear start. And then you, you look at his verbal, nonverbal, you listen to the verbal, look at his nonverbal, boom, 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 boom. And then you realize, but I gotta shut this thing down. Someone else has to introduce themselves or he has to go next. And boy, that's that. And what happens when that happens is that you don't really get a full understanding of who uh, you are out to the person at a critical moment in time when your value and worth, if you're interviewing or you're coming onto a company or into a company matters so greatly. So well, why does this matter? Well, Forbes thinks that it matters because they said, hey, you know, this is one of the ways you can get to a fruitful life is by using this book as an apparatus for organizing your life. So again, remember this book is, wasn't written uh, about me. It was written for the reader. So the reader could use it really as a manual and Forbes identified it more as like a narrative creation formula, which I thought was really a clever way to think about it. And the, the question, tell me about yourself, shouldn't be something that, that is a surprising something ever, really. It really shouldn't be. And so to, I'm going to get you to the model just so you understand it. I come from, again, working full time and going to school full time for my master's in uh, leadership and ethics, as well as my PhD in organizational systems, heavily influenced by humanistic psychology. And that's the school that I went to had this funny guy on the left side who wasn't there at the time, Abraham Maslow. So I like triangles, right? What can I say? They're a great form of organizing data and information. And when, and when you think about how you are as a human being, you're focused on safety needs, right? You know, if you fly somewhere, you want to be safe. You don't not, you know, you don't try to self-actualize and help other people feel good about their lives. You want to be safe. Then you want to belong, right? But, but what is most important for us? Breathing and eating at the base of the triangle. So breathe, eat, be safe, have shelter, belong, have, you know, feel good about yourself, self-confidence. And then you can, you know, start to be creative and, and, and really, you know, this is aspirational and it's true that we want to be somebody. So Maslow sort of got that from a human motivational standpoint. But this, what does this have to do with self-authorship? Well, self-authorship, this is from some, another theorist, but I like to make things real. So we're going to get out of theory in a minute, but I want to show you that there's a science behind this. Self-authorship is the ability to tell your story, to craft your story from real events. On the left side of this diagram or this box, you'll see that that means that it has cognitive development, it just really means that you have evidence of your life to explain who you are, interpersonal development, so that the relationships that you make at work, in the middle and out of work, are interpersonally developed in a way to support this identity that you want, okay? And there are a lot of different ways to get there. So I created a model called the Peak Storytelling Model. And I'm going to explain it to you now in about two to three minutes. So here's the deal. I, I did a lot of research. You know, I wrote a dissertation. I was going to school full time. I was watching people butcher their own stories, coming into great companies with great intentions and not telling the whole story and, and you know, not being invited to do 16 more reps of why they should be doing, uh, why they should be hearing, be heard a second or third or fourth time. So it's kind of funny, right? Because you go tell your story, you're not prepared for it. And then you can't go back and say, hey, uh, let me give it a go till I get it right, right? That seems like you don't know who you are. So that actually means that you probably don't have value and worth and you, you don't even know why you're here. So it, it's a real problem. So at any rate, I wrote this dissertation and then I kept working on my practice with pro sports people and others uh, who are in high stakes scenarios as well as students at Roger Williams University. And here's what I determined, that there are three levels of story. Put it in a triangular format because Ultimately, you want to be doing work that you love. That's why there's a, a love a, a love mark at the top, right? Uh, the triangle. And 
what is really critical is that, that you, we all realize that there's a type of story that I saw over and over again, and that's the hero story. And the hero story wasn't the traditional, I'm gonna save somebody like Matt before he gets hit by a train, pull him off the street corner in Manhattan before a cab runs over his toes or an Uber. And I'm not saying that they're bad drivers, just as for an example only, folks. So, no, no, a hero story is, is, is starting with me because in the world, I start with me. So I am overcoming an obstacle through either adaptability, maybe it's being clever, creative, maybe it's uh, standing up to a bully, maybe it's learning a second language, uh, maybe it's being open to others and having self-leadership. So there's some sort of moment, and those are the blue dots. And what I realized is that the, the, the oops, I'm sorry, thank you for set, saying the slideshow format. Let me see if this helps. We want to make sure that you see the whole thing. And let's see if this works and helps you. Thank you, whoever made that comment in the comment section. That was really great. Is that better or no? Let's see. It's still not better. Okay. This is a little. Oh, yes, it's better. That's it. Okay. okay. Yes, we're hearing better. All right. Thank you, Phyllis, Augustina, Laura. Oh, this is fantastic. I love the feedback. Um, I can't go. Let me see if I can go full screen yet. Just, uh, Matt, tell me if this is better. Is this better or no? It's defaulting back to the PowerPoint uh, presentation itself. Okay. So how about how about now? There we go. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So we'll roll with this then. And thank you for everybody giving me feedback. And that's the way storytelling works too, right? You don't just show up and tell a story. So some things happen. So having a structure allows you to pause, answer the question, and tell the rest of your story. So that wasn't a designed... Uh, learning activity within the presentation, but that's true. So and, what happened? Real <laughs> yes. quick, uh, this is the 15 minute. Oh, perfect, excellent. So we're right where we need to be, right? So, so here, here's what I learned. There are three types of stories that are linked to formative experiences or call them self-event connections. These are so impressionable, these moments, that you know it might take a little while to find them, but when you find them, they have rich information in them. And if you can connect them, whatever lane of life that they're in, work, family, friends, hobby, roles, whatever, spiritual in nature, whatever lane that they're in, if you want to be able to explain who you are in any, in any capacity, if you can find a hero moment that is really impressionable and connect it to a collaborative moment when you are working with others to create something, because it shows that it's a working together story, you're capable of working together, then when you lead to the virtuous work, a virtuous story, that's a blue dot or a moment where you are in love with the thing that you're doing and it would be immoral for you not to keep doing it, okay? So now, why is that important? Because if I show up and say, oh, I love teaching, I wanna be a professor. Uh, okay, <laughs> all right, pal, that's cool. Do you wear a bow tie? Yes, I wear a bow tie. No, that's not gonna sell the deal. But if I say, look, I used to race BMX before the X Games, and I was so I was little, I was smaller than the other kids. Now I'm 5'11 and you know 175, but I was a, I was small. I was a late bloomer. So I had to calculate things. I had to use math and I had to use my brain to process how I could beat kids that were 20 and 30 pounds heavier than me on BMX bikes. And what I didn't realize is that I taught myself and I taught others how to be able to hack conditions physically by thinking, you know, using mental skills. And uh, when we had a fire and I had a little accident with my bike, I kind of, they thought I broke my neck, but it was a cervical sprain. And we had a fire in the house, all these things at the same time. What happened was I started uh, pouring myself into science. And I learned being uh, hooked initially by physics that my science fair projects that kept winning, because I went to a school where they made you do it, um, were winning, not because I was this great physics kid in the making, but because I knew how to speak to adults or had to learn to, 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 to teach them. So it's actually teaching them. So then I look back in my life and I'm like, wait a minute, I was actually teaching other kids in the neighborhood how to be BMX riders as I was riding throughout the Northeast corridor. And then I started teaching science for people about how my project could better, you know, the FBI fingerprint identification process. And actually I'm always teaching. And when I was in business, I was teaching people by creating learning programs at Alex and Ani, the Sports Mind Institute, you know, uh, Spartan. And then I realized, wait a minute, my story is I want to be a professor because I've lived in the real world where work happens. And if you can intersect work with systems that can support rapid, right, rapid learning and integration of people into teams, 
then what happens is you're really doing the best kind of professorial work you can do. So yes, I'm a professor, but I'm an unusual professor. I sit on the fringe. I sit on the fringe of complexity, of education, where leadership, innovation, technology, and learning are all kind of hovering around. But my story now justifies that. Now, if I just said I like to wear a bow tie, you'd be like, well, tell me why. What in your brain actually allows you to be that teacher? So the dots that you connect, and we often hear that, dots connect in life. The dots that you connect, if you connect them well in a three-stage story, you can be validated for who you are. And I did this with Evan during his um, C-suite sponsored uh, podcast that we did together. And it was so much fun. And so I love being put on the spot to help people find what competencies, and the book does this, shows you what competencies are in each blue dot. Were you receptive? Were you uh, an organized person? You knew how things work. Were you adaptable? What was in your blue dot? Because when you dissect the blue dot, you have to use another tool. We call this a story stamp. So think about each one of those dots as having this transparency over it that actually allows you to say to yourself, wow, what was I actually doing there when I overcame that problem with my brother or with in the neighborhood or in that first job I had as a fintech person, right? Well, you can, well, I was analytical, but I didn't know how to adapt. So there's a plus and a minus there. I was around people who loved innovation. That was cool. What place was I? Well, I was in Boston. Boston was cool, but I really want to go to Northern California. But, um, but our place was like an unusually designed workplace and we had a lot of flexibility. So you start, and what was my motivation? Uh, to be looked at as an innovator. Okay, what else? Well, to be part of a team, what else? Um, and then you find out why that blue dot mattered so much. Okay, now when you do that, you're able to use this other tool in the book, we call it the four square, and you look at these slices, okay, these slices of the blue dot and the story stamp, and you start to find out stuff about yourself, right? Competencies you collect, this is like a sorting tool, folks. This allows you to collect competencies, look at your motivation, understand the power of people, the power of place. And for me, the symbol, we help people get to a symbol that can kind of unify their story. It's all about being able to help people speak better about themselves, which is a very difficult thing to do. So that you can be seen as whatever it might be, maybe the pioneer quester, the, the hero wizard, the, you know, the sage, you know, the sage uh, caregiver, whatever it is that uh, you'd like to fashion yourself to be from your life story. And, you know, a lot of folks have been pretty much digging the book um, in the university life and then out in the world of uh, solving the obstacles of, <laughs> of your life. Joe DeSena, I've worked with for a number of years and, you know, he's really enjoyed the book and uh, sharing his comments here. And, you know, Dr. Uh, Wanda Heading Grant likes it because it helps uh, with diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, so we're really seeing all kinds of different ways to, uh, you know, play it forward and integrate it. This is just a, a quick, uh, I guess it's a little bit of a, an appetizer. I, I was invited to the University of Chicago Booth School to, um, to explain how this can help with career transitions. So that's the book, that's the deal. And uh, I hope that was, uh, I hope that was, that was pretty helpful. Um, let me see if I can go into full video mode now, maybe, yeah. And uh, we can say hello. Okay, great. Um, let's get to questions, because yeah, I know you have some. And we only have a few moments. So, uh, Matt, do you want to feel them for me? Uh, the hero and collaborative comment. Yeah. So uh, definitely, Maria. Um, okay. So, so th the way I look at so think about it this way as a, a, a three stage storytelling system, right? So the hero moment is always about overcoming obstacles, and as you overcome obstacles, you go to work with others, right? Because life is a social sport, and so is work. And then when you can cite a collaborative moment within your, your peak story. So the idea is that each dot is, is like one third of the story and the total bit will, will create the peak story. And then what happens is you're really signaling why it's really powerful. And I've learned this through my formal university research and then also my practice um, is that people start to see evidence of, right? They see evidence of your collaboration, your ability to create something with others. It's not you saying, oh, I love collaboration. It's an embedded moment within the story. And that really helps um, the individual who's a listener, whether it's a large group or one-to-one -one, uh, episodic version, for, for them to say, wow, this is evidence of the thing that is right for this particular job or this particular moment. And then the aspirational bit, um, you know, which is really the virtuous bit, explains why you should be doing the work that you should be doing within that role. So three stages, hero, overcoming obstacles, self-leadership, adaptability, typically something like that, by yourself, then with others, creating something with another, getting along stories on the route to the work that's more purposeful and identifiable as really your, your go-to contribution. And by the way, this is a philosophy and a, an apparatus for organizing your story. 
So if you're thinking, hey, is my story fixed? It's not fixed. This is just a method for you to sort through the blue dots of your life as new one, because you're a blue dot collector, right? You're going to keep living and doing things and you'll have to kind of make a priority as to which ones now are important to you. Okay. Uh, yes, we have someone else on screen even. I think that's me. <laughs> yeah. Good to, good to <laughs> Another meet. Dennis. I go by yeah. my last name, Althar, because we're branding the name. Oh, I love that. I, yeah. Since birth almost, since I was five years old, I've had a passion for electronics. So I read every book and I was raised in the projects. I read every book at the local library on electronics, on the adult and the children's side. I left home when I was 14 out of the project, still graduated high school. I was a super geek in electronics. So I ended up being in the military highly praised and worldwide known for what I did in the military, actually the highest grades they've ever had and the fastest testing times. So I'm like an Uber Greek. I've known Steve Wozniak. I had the first Apple That's computers, great. first one with a hard drive. I built medical equipment for uh, that's used in the cardiac cath labs. Over 85% of the cath labs in the country had my gear. And Amazing. what I really have a passion about is for people to be able to understand other people when they speak. So four years ago, I was helping a friend that was doing preaching in the Cleveland Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. And you know how a gym is so echoey? I actually prayed about it and in a dream. My backgrounds in, in sonar and radar and ultrasound worldwide. And I figured out how to beamform speakers where we throw sound that's the same volume at 10 feet or 180 degrees across, across 1,000 feet. We can cover a football field with a 16 pound speaker weatherproof and we could sit underneath that speaker and have this conversation and fill the football field so we're going to be the next bose we're wow. going to be bigger than them we're going to buy wow. them and jbl and we've sold 400 of these word of mouth we haven't even started marketing but i'm wow. a steve wozniak i'm real involved with first robotics etc cetera, etc cetera. oh i'm I mean, looking for a steve jobs out there that yeah. can really do the mark could i've done zero marketing i'm just super geek so i'm well, the guy well, That's I think what's, I, I, yeah, the Steve W and the Steve J connection is a really big one. By the way, just uh, Dennis, this is what's really cool about this. You know, uh, yeah, Janet saying, can you redo this? Yeah. So what I would consider doing, like if I were to re, if I were to use the methodology on your story, right? So if I introduce you and I tell me about yourself, right? If you did the, all that you did just now, that's a lot, right? And there's <laughs> some theme, right? There is, but there are some good themes there and some good uh, blue dots. So. If I think of your hero story, your hero story, and I'm going to be conscious of time, so I think I'm just going to do it. So I'm going to do your your story right now. So, uh, well, good, the good news is my name is Dennis, so it'll be really easy for you, Athar. To you know, to, but so you, you're going to be me. Actually, we'll do this with Matt. Matt will be. I'll be. I'll be you, Athar, and we're going to meet. We're going to meet at a conference, and you're going to. I'm going to use elements of the story you just did to do to do this a little bit differently. Okay. Um, so, hey, Matt, good to meet you. And you, you you can say tell me about yourself or whatever after you say the pleasantries. Great to meet you. Uh, can yeah. you tell me about yourself, Dennis? Yeah, well, it's a long story. Th that's not how you start, by the way. Oh, that, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. That's me being kind of goofy, right? Never start. Well, it's a long story. Well, it's a little this. Don't ever do that. Well, it's, it's sort of compelling. I mean, I started as um, I started a little bit as a geek. So what's your blue dot? Your first blue dot? Althar, what's your first blue dot? We're gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth to exemplify how to do this. What is your first blue dot that you gave me? Learning electronics at the local library. Okay. So I ended so that, up owning that building. It's the only 10 sided building in the country. Right. So now <laughs> if you overhead, if you make that too heavy, that can overtake everything because it sounds like you, you're the person who's gonna solve all world problems. So the problem with a too, a too heavy weighted uh, uh, a hero story. So it has to be done and very, see how you went like this. You got all excited because it's a great point. So here's how we soften it. We say something like this. So, well, Matt, you know, I was, uh, I grew up in the projects. Did you hear about that? No. Why do I do this? Cause Matt's like, what the heck? He's asking me a question because I'm going to hook him in fast. Go Matt. I did not hear about that. Can you tell me about it? Well, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to. It's, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, I was bored. And when we were bored as a kid, I think you need to find things to explore. And so what I looked at, did was I looked around and I said, what resources do I have in front of me right now at this uh, particular juncture? And uh, didn't realize what a little explorer I was, but I was a little bit of a pioneer quester. I went to the local library, found everything I could on electronics. 
and began not just thinking and absorbing, but converting my thinking to doing right away. So now if I stop right there, Matt would probably say something. What would you say, Matt? That's amazing. Uh, no, yeah. Were I, you an industrious, were you an industrious little kid too? Were you an industrious little kid too? I'm asking, I'm asking you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, I do yeah. apologize. Because you have to, you have to. I, I oh yeah, do, you're monitoring. All right, let me do Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah I got you, man. I got you. So here, here, yeah, yeah. Next one's popping in. So here's the deal. I'd, I'd go, to, I'd go short on that hero bit. I'd go into the collaborative and I'd say, okay. So I'd continue with Matt and say, you know, Matt, what, what I didn't realize is that um, you needed a lot of other people. It wasn't just me being like this, you know, little smart kid who is, you know, devouring books and converting and making electronics. And when I worked in the military, I realized that when you have multiple perspectives that you can engage people and that you can build innovative products. And that allowed us to really impact on a national, international level, the way sound was received and sent from Navy vessels or whatever it is, plug, plug, plug in the blanks. And now what I realize uh, is that I'm still not done and that my, my, I'm really uh, this, this pioneer uh, venturer who actually loves to be on uh, the cutting edge. And, and I look at whatever the most competitive thing is and I wanna be better. So it keeps me tuned in, so to speak, right? Um, and there are too many echoes and there's too much technology that can be improved. So I decided to hone in on figuring out the best way to get the smallest device to fill uh, stadiums and to do it leveraging sort of this military way of thinking, but to make it commercially friendly. At any rate, that's where I'm going these days. And so we're gonna probably overshadow Bose, so you'll be hearing about us. So anyway, so we do this, right? Um, and you know, things like this, uh, Maria, that's funny. Um, you know, I love the comments on the side. If you are interested in storytelling, if you're interested in the book, love to be able to honor you and the work that you do within your organizations. Also, we absolutely must talk a little bit more, not just because your name is my name and my name is your name, but because your narrative has power. And for entrepreneurs, your identity-based story has to be packaged well, because if it's packaged well, it'll also inform your employees, your team members, your colleagues, your culture will start to evolve. And less words can be used just like jujitsu, you don't, or boxing or tennis or any sport or chess. You don't want to waste a lot of moves. You want to use language with, with a bit of finesse, understand themes and be able to stitch it into particular moments. We're done. I appreciate all of you. Thanks for joining.